Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jill Jacobson, and I'm president of the Boston College Law School chapter. We're here with Professor Arm Gavor to chat about his experience with the Administrative Law Group and his new publication on administrative investigations in the Indiana Law Journal. Hi, Professor Gavor. Thanks for being with us. Thanks so much, Jill. Professor Gavor is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at GW Law School and a nationally recognized scholar in the fields of administrative law, federal courts, and national security law. Professor Gavor has briefed and argued over a dozen cases before a majority of the U.S. Courts of Appeals. He has litigated in nearly a third of the 94 U.S. District Courts and is a regular speaker at various Federal Society events. Before I turn it over to Professor Gavor, I would like to give a brief overview of what exactly Federal Society practice groups are. They are professional groups organized by substantive areas of law. Each practice group is led by a chairman and an executive committee comprised of top lawyers from across the country. They meet each month to organize in-person events, webinars, publications, and the panels for the Federal Society National Lawyers Convention. So, Professor Gavor, how long have you been involved with the Admin Law Practice Group? So, I've been involved with the Admin Law Practice Group since, I would say, 2019. And can you describe some of the work that you all do in this group? Yeah, absolutely. So, the <clears throat> Admin Law Practice Group is a cross-cutting practice group because it focuses predominantly on public law issues associated with the administrative state, usually at the federal level, uh, increasingly at the state level. But when uh, those structures are in place, it usually involves a subject of some sort, labor, employment, environment, immigration, something. Uh, so our practice group uh, crosses some of the boundaries, some of the silos, uh, and then also there are some administrative law exclusive subject matters, such as judicial deference doctrine, notice and comment and rulemaking, adjudications, that type of thing. And how can students or recent graduates get involved with the administrative law practice group? Well, the, the easiest way is to uh, follow the materials online. Um, there's, there's all kinds of telephora that the practice group does. The National Lawyers Convention, uh, which is usually at the Mayflower every year, D.C., uh, the end of the second weekend in November. And then also uh, to join the practice group. Uh, there's a number of, uh, there's a very large amount of folks who uh, are essentially members of the practice group, subscribe to the materials. Uh, and, and I think that would be the basket uh, from which to pick. Wonderful. So I would love to transition now to your newest work on administrative investigations in the Indiana Law Journal. Um, I want to mention the audience members are encouraged to ask questions, and you can do so using the chat function on Zoom. We'll get to audience questions towards the end of the chat. So I'd like to open with a quote from Professor Sudstein that you quote in your article saying that agencies have evolved to become modern America's common law courts meaning that agencies specify abstract standards, often involving reasonableness, and adapt legal rules to particular contexts as facts, social understanding of facts, and underlying values change over time. Will you contextualize this quote for the audience? Sure thing. So uh, the modern administrative state uh, defined essentially as federal executive branch agencies that were created by Congress uh, with the vesting authorities uh, of Article One. Uh, but still supervised uh, and under the Article II control by the Appointments Clause, uh, Take Care Clause authority, uh, and other authorities of Article II of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, this represents the bulk of the federal government. It's not Congress. It's not just the President or the White House. It's the millions and millions of folks uh, and hundreds of agencies at the federal level that regulate all kinds of things um, that we would just consider normal in life, from uh, from from paint to light bulbs to uh, immigration procedures to public health, public safety, uh, financial issues, labor, employment. The list goes on and on. Great. Um, it's funny. I don't think people imagine the big institutional behemoth that is all of the various agencies underneath the federal government. Um, all right, that's an interesting point. So one thing that I wanted to ask you is your article is one of the first of its kind. And why do you think that this topic is so under theorized in the literature? And it might help to give the audience sort of uh, a little summary of what exactly your article focuses on. And then why is this, given its importance, why is it so under theorized? 
Sure. So maybe if, if you can indulge me with maybe a couple of minutes just uh, to walk through the, the thesis of it, uh, that, that might help. Uh, so executive branch agency, uh, they are largely regulated by a statute called the Administrative Procedure Act. It's from 1946, and it regulates essentially two bodies of behavior. Rulemaking, where agencies engage in legislative type interpretations of their authorizing statutes, gaps, silences, uh, express authorizations, and the like. Uh, so that would be notice and comment rulemaking, subregulatory rulemaking, which would be guidance documents, FAQs, uh, procedural rules, interpretive rules, and the like. Uh, sometimes speeches, statements, tweets, uh, those, uh, those expressions of policy. But then also adjudications, uh, where uh, agencies sit more in a judicial type of setting, where they will either on the receptive end decide whether to grant a license, some sort of a benefit, uh, or to revoke one of those, or on the affirmative end, to engage in an investigation or in an enforcement action. So if you apply for a passport, you are participating in an adjudication. Uh, if you file a tax return, uh, and the tax return, and I hope you file a tax return, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, if the IRS audits you, that's essentially uh, the makings of an enforcement action. And then outside of what I would call traditional cabinet level agencies, which would be the things that you would think, you know, that, that you see the agencies where the heads sit in the president's cabinet. So that would typically be uh, single head uh, secretarial departments uh, involving, let's say, Department of Energy, Labor, uh, EPA, Justice, Homeland Security, State, uh, Agriculture, Commerce, uh, and a number of others. There's also independent agencies as well uh, that have uh, varying degrees of independence from the executive branch uh, and tend to be a little bit closer to Congress in the orbit. How are they independent? Well, there's a number of different uh, ways in which they are. Uh, one is they usually uh, tend to have, uh, at least if they're constitutionally sound, they will have multiple members uh, subject to the appointments clause of the Constitution, just like uh, cabinet level agencies, but there's multiple member heads, so boards, commissions, and the like. And usually they are they are all going to be subject to uh, senatorial confirmation through advice and consent. So Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2 of the Constitution. But then they will sometimes have staggered terms. There might be constraints on political affiliation uh, among the nominees. Uh, and sometimes they will have four cause removal protections, which is that the president is not free to, in his sole and unfettered discretion, remove uh, uh, an officer of the United States that he appoints and the Senate confirms, or that he nominates, the Senate confirms, and then he then appoints uh, to those agencies. So administrative investigations, uh, what I'm talking about in my work that I co-published uh, with Steve Platt, is the subject of agency information gathering that is not regulated by the APA. So the APA only regulates rules, adjudications, licenses, that type of a thing. Uh, but it does not engage in regulation on compulsory or semi-compulsory information collections uh, of the regulated public. Why is it so understudied? Uh, well, first, it's unregulated. So if it's unregulated, uh, if there's a little bit less attention on it, there's almost no judicial review on it because of a couple cases uh, from 1946 and 1950, Oklahoma Press Publishing Company versus Walling and U United States versus Morton Salt, which essentially uh, shunted off any ability for members of the regulated public, you, small business, big corporation, uh, sometimes a municipality, from actually being able to meaningfully challenge an investigation that's more like a fishing expedition from time to time. And uh, what got me into the space? Uh, observation. Observation from uh, folks engaging in issue advocacy litigation and just my own study of it. Uh, the material, I would say, uh, Dan Epstein is a person uh, that comes to mind. He, in the early to mid uh, 2010s, uh, brought forth a number of interesting litigations with the Cause of Action Institute. Uh, and there's a number of other organizations uh, that do this type of work. 
uh, everything from the New Civil Liberties Alliance to, uh, I would say, to the surprise of some, the ACLU. Great. So prior to reading your article, I wasn't really aware of the level of damage that an unwarranted agency investigation can do to a private company, big or small. Um, and I suspect that many of our listeners aren't either. Will you talk a little bit about that and perhaps give an example of these unintended consequences that unchecked investigative power can cause? Sure thing. So first, I want to start off with the premise, um, they're not per se evil. Uh, the, if the executive branch does not have the power to investigate, to find out information, it just largely won't function. So for those who are uh, critical, uh, I would say anti-administrativists who think that the administrative state is largely unlawful, then of course uh, they can indeed be viewed as evil. But from a pragmatic perspective, uh, and this is since the dawn of, <laughs> of mankind, so long as there's been government, uh, government, uh, governments have been trying to find things out, uh, especially when it comes to here, uh, a, a pretty advanced democracy with a world's strongest economy, highly sophisticated bodies um, of regulation, uh, over-regulation in a number of areas to be absolutely sure, uh, engaging in investigative work. Now, we live in a fear-based society. How is that, uh, how is that structured, fear of government? By our constitution, right? We have <laughs> checks and balances, some pretty strong constraints uh, on, on governmental behavior. Uh, so it's not just executive branch behavior, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, behavior of the legislat legislature as well. But the challenge and the problem here is because administrative investigations are unregulated. So it's essentially the fact finding that could eventually lead to an enforcement action. Uh, there's no, I would say, fear-based, fairness-based structural constraints or even internal constraints besides trust us for the government uh, to make sure that your individual rights are being protected. So when you have a gap in uh, self-constraint and certainly inter-branch constraint, uh, which would be you know, the judiciary providing meaningful check, the legislature providing regulation, essentially through statute, through bicameralism and presentment uh, of how the executive branch agencies are to engage in their fact-finding function, that can be a little bit of a cesspool uh, for the abrogation of individual liberties. Uh, and the, the damage can be pretty severe. So uh, everything from a small business uh, where the government's knocking on the door saying, hey, let us in. Uh, we're not looking to blow your house down. We just want some papers. Uh, but by the way, uh, if you don't let us in, we can come back with uh, a subpoena or a civil investigative demand. Um, and if you don't comply with that, we can sue you in court to get this information. It's sort of uh, the implied power of compulsion. Uh, a lot of small businesses, a lot of large businesses, indeed, uh, let the government in, get information. Usually, that's the end of it. Uh, but also, that might not be the end of it. They might want more information. They might be uh, looking for a violation of law where none existed. It might be a competitor uh, in, in your industry that uh, made an anonymous complaint to the government knocking now on your door for information. And the damage could be first the burden of responding to the investigation, uh, the inability to capably oppose it, especially let's say if the government is interpreting and authorizing statute in a new and broad way and using that interpretation to engage in investigation for a possible violation of law uh, that, that it is never enunciated as an area of its own regulatory authority. Uh, yeah, sometimes and in certain industries are very, very sensitive uh, to investigations. So pharmaceutical industry, for example. Um, if it is known, uh, let's say that the FDA is investigating uh, maker of Tylenol <laughs> for uh, adulterants uh, in its product, that will have a huge market effect. Uh, and uh, so too with many industries. So just the fact that there's governmental investigation can uh, substantially soften uh, consumer confidence, but it can also soften uh, the investability, uh, the investment worthiness of, uh, of a company if it's under investigation, right? If, if you have money you're about to lend, it's two companies, 
one of which is under government investigation for something that might be scary, <laughs> one of which is not, uh, where are you going to invest your money? Uh, and also just stock prices. Uh, and and there's, there's many more possible areas of, of damage or consequence that can flow from this, but I think that's a good start. Definitely. The words under government investigation, whether it's well-founded or not, um, are surely deter uh, many people. Um, so perhaps this is a naive question, but it's more curious from my perspective. Why doesn't the Fourth Amendment protect businesses uh, in this way, the way that it would under a police investigation, for example? Great question. Uh, simply put, because the Supreme Court concluded that it doesn't. Uh, but it concluded that uh, a long time ago, 1946 and 1950, uh, when the composition of the federal government was very different and the types of investigations it was doing were very different um, from what's happening now. So I think there's a lot of uh, avenue, a lot of space, uh, especially with particularly uh, robustly uh, enforcement-oriented agencies engaging in uh, conduct that is very novel. So um, SEC, CFPB, Federal Trade Commission. So it's really the independent agencies uh, that you really want to pay close attention to for those types of things. Uh, I, I think that under the right circumstances, there are um, a variety of mechanisms that could be attempted anew uh, that, that might have a different outcome. Again, I want to stress uh, many times when the government investigates, the investigated target has actually done something that warrants investigation. Uh, and I don't want to sit here and say um, that there aren't lots of times where the investigated target has violated the law. Uh, and, and ultimately, an enforcement is, is, is squarely within the authority of the statute um, and supports the public policy as described uh, and envisioned in the statute that Congress passed authorizing the agency to engage in its work. But again, just because you have uh, even a majority of conduct that's great, uh, or at least that is appropriate for the application of asymmetric governmental investigative power and enforcement power, that's not how our system of government is designed. We have the Bill of Rights. Uh, those are the predominant counter-majoritarian protections, protecting the, the individual, the minority, the small guy, or the small people um, from the majoritarian tyranny. Uh, and, and it doesn't get more powerful uh, than, the, uh, than the federal government. Would you say the motivation for your research is more so uh, finding a way to deter unwarranted agency investigations or making sure the rules of the game are are fair regardless as they would be for any sort of formal judicial proceeding or or some third category that I've yet to mention? So that's a fair question. I think a majority of my research is mostly just to uh, attempt a taxonomy of, hey, this exists. Here's how it's defined. Here's how we can consider it. Why does this happen? Uh, what is it? What is the domain? of this large, what I call almost dark matter of administrative law that exists, must exist for the positive matter that, that we see regulated to function, right? Adjudications, a large body of adjudications wouldn't occur, but for the government being in possession of certain facts. Uh, and it gets those facts oftentimes through investigative processes that are semi or outright compulsory in nature. Uh, so. Uh, on, on the solution side of the ledger, uh, there is no just do this one thing because the behavior is so remarkably large and varied and the authorizing statutes are so different from each other and the agency investigative processes and tactics differ so very much that it's tough to just say, oh, just do this. But I think there's different baskets uh, of solutions that if uh, applied in concert with one another, uh, with some degree of intentionality, uh, things can get better. Ultimately, we're just looking for fundamental fairness, some, as simple as that, and then also making sure that when the government is engaging in investigation, it's doing so with authorities that it indeed has and is utilizing in a method and manner that is consistent with federal law and ideally public policy. So how do you do that? Well, at least on the judicial review end, uh, one, uh, one 
phenomenon I've observed is that the Supreme Court has become more and more comfortable with allowing APA review, Administrative Procedure Act of 1946 review, of agency actions earlier and earlier in the timeline um, than what the government would otherwise describe as final under Section 704 of that statute. So earlier review is a good thing. Uh, another constraint uh, that I think could be useful is for the Supreme Court to reevaluate the domain of Fourth Amendment protections for the civilly investigated, especially if the subject matter of investigation could be the type that could easily transition into a criminal investigation uh, for which the evidence that the government possesses did not need to go through Fourth Amendment scrutiny. I think that's another, another potential tool. Another tool would be for Congress, and I think this is the chief tool, to regulate the space. <laughs> when agencies are investigating, here's what they need to do, guardrails judicial review for certain types of investigations, certain types of claims. It's a constitutional claim. That should be something that uh, Congress as a function of public policy and the courts as a function of judicial review might need to be more hospitable towards. And in addition to that, especially if the agents, if, if the basis of challenge is that the agency does not have the authority to engage in the investigation that it is doing right now, that really needs to be subject to some sort of judicial review or internal constraint or regulation earlier in the time frame. Because otherwise, the only solution as it exists in the law today is you have to wait and wait and wait and essentially suffer, <laughs> go through this process until the agency ultimately decides, closes its investigation, then you still can't challenge it. But if it then enforces upon you, you ultimately lose in front of the agency sometimes need to take a compulsory appeal to a superior agency body. And then, and only then, usually like three or four years later, your business has either ended uh, or has gone bankrupt, or if you're a large enough business to sustain it, you, know, you spent some millions of dollars, then you get your day in court. That doesn't seem super duper fair. That doesn't seem very American. <laughs> uh, and this is not to say that the government shouldn't be able to investigate. It needs to investigate. But there's no constraints uh, uh, on the earlier side. It's really just to trust us with the government. And, and that's not especially palatable, I think, to our system of government. Um, it's, it's a careful balancing act for sure. Do you think that the congressional avenue has any promise or uh, out of the solutions that you propose, which do you think uh, is most feasible or, or that you would push for first? So in terms of an ideal circumstance, I think in a perfect world, Congress would regulate this. We don't live in a perfect world. And I, I think uh, any sort of reform or modification of the APA so amended to this point is more or less likely to be elusive. That doesn't mean you don't try, right? Because that is, you know, that is how our government functions, and that's the primary way by which this gets resolved. Uh, it's, it's a function of plenary authority of the Congress to regulate the conduct of its own agencies uh, that it creates and, and, are, and are essentially administered by the executive branch. Short of that, I think um, there's a strong incentive structure within the executive branch, uh, even under democratic administrations, uh, to, to provide some countermeasures in place just to make sure that agencies aren't uh, potentially in their zeal uh, or just in, in their good faith attempt to follow through on their authorizing statute, but in a silo from going too far. And then I think the judicial review pillar uh, is really, unfortunately, the most lasting and likely of avenues uh, by which these types of behaviors will be challenged. Sure. I'm not sure how many people are signing up to self-regulate, but let's let's hope that they do. Um, where do you see the case law moving or or rather, where would you like to see the case law moving? Yeah. So in terms of where I see the case law moving, uh, the Supreme Court just in this term is looking a little bit earlier and earlier um, in the adjudicative timeline 
uh, for judicial review, at least for constitutional challenges. So you have Axon and Cochran uh, that was argued last month before the court. So I think the, the 704 final agency action, Bennett versus Speer 1997 test, is modified by Sackett and then Hawks. Uh, that is something that uh, the Supreme Court will probably pay some attention to. I, I think there's probably innovations, opportunities um, for the right kind of case uh, to potentially uh, reevaluate whether the law from 1946 to 1950, the case law, um, really needs to remain stable. I think there is some space uh, to, to try to uh, get additional review there. And then the last piece of it, um, and I think this is pretty useful, uh, would be for uh, regulated parties, especially when they are the subject to investigation that they disagree with, to, to not just capitulate. Uh, usually capitulation is the right business move, but it might not be the right move under some circumstances, uh, just to get more active in their advocacy, because uh, it really comes down to fundamental fairness. Great. Okay. I think we're going to move to audience questions now as we only have a few minutes left. Um, we have a question from Tom. He says, regarding the Fourth Amendment, I thought I heard early an earlier response that it does not apply to commercial entities and administrative investigations. My understanding was that the Fourth Amendment does apply. And the difference is that when police show up, they have a search warrant with judicial review having occurred on the front end. Whereas when CID or subpoena shows up, the recipient has an opportunity for ju judicial review on the back end, but before the deadline by seeking a protective order. What are your thoughts, Professor? So that's correct. On the criminal side, absolutely. You know, that's that's where all those Fourth Amendment protections come in. Uh, the for CIDs, the the standard to actually achieve um, the judiciary to set aside uh, or to issue, you know, to to quash or issue a protective order, it, I just don't see that actually providing a meaningful countermeasure. So uh, I, I think the court, uh, I think the best approach is for the for the court to look at anew the holdings of Oklahoma Press Publishing Company versus Walling and U.S. versus Morton Salt. Um, from 1946 and 1950, respectively. Great. Okay, I think we're nearing the end of our time. Um, I'd like to thank Professor Gavor for speaking, the Federal Society for putting this together. Um, thank you so much, Professor Gavor. This has been a wonderful conversation. My total pleasure. Thanks so much, Jill. She's actually taking a study break. She has her professional responsibility exam later this week, and she's giving her time to host this event. Uh, we're grateful to you. It's been great. Well, I hope everyone's enjoyed this study. Great break and have a great night. Thank you.